Welcome to today's episode of Untethering Shame. I'm your host, Kira Wackett, and today we're diving deep into a topic that affects not only our children's classrooms, but the emotional well-being of those leading them, teachers. Teaching is often seen as a profession focused on lesson plans, curriculum, and student achievement. But what we don't often talk about is the emotional load and responsibility that teachers carry every day in and out. It's a role that demands not only knowledge, but immense emotional energy, often without the external reinforcement that can make this work sustainable. Joining me today is Diane Mansur, an 18-year veteran high school English teacher in her 19th year this year, which is so exciting, author and founder of Teaching is Emotional. Diane has dedicated her career not just to educating students, but to understanding and navigating the emotional complexities that come with teaching. Her book and business have become a beacon for educators looking to build community and share strategies for empowerment in the face of the immense emotional challenges they face. She's also a mom, a wife, and a self-described lover of nonfiction who stays grounded by regularly reconnecting with her why. In this episode, we're going to explore how teachers are often positioned as caregivers in ways that leaves them feeling responsible yet out of control. We'll talk about the extrinsic rewards or lack thereof that make it difficult for teachers to feel good about their work, even when they're well-liked by students. And we'll discuss the harmful idea of teacher self-care, which often shifts the responsibility for systemic issues back onto teachers themselves. Whether you're a teacher or a parent sending your kids into these spaces, this conversation is about understanding the emotional weight of teaching and how we can better support our educators. So let's dive in. Diane, welcome. I'm so excited for this. Me too, Kira. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that beautiful introduction that so well and succinctly described my work and about me and why we're here talking. Thank you so much. I am very excited to be talking today. Thank you for having me on. I couldn't wait for it, honestly. Thank oh, you. I know. I know. I feel like the day that we met, I was like, why Why are we not recording right now? We could just go all in. And so, I mean, I think the cool part is to be so excited to have conversations that often are really uncomfortable, that people don't think are fun, don't get excited about. And the idea being that when we're coming with this energy, it means that we see a way through, a way out, a way around, whatever it is. And so I always love that starting conversations like this, when we can feel that sentiment, it really helps ground, I think, the energy that listeners can have. And I'm curious for you, because again, you're in your 19th year, which Mm -hmm. is amazing in any career, but just to say a 19 year vet as a teacher just seems so cool. So exciting in high school. I mean, that's fantastic. And I'm curious because this has become so much of your focus talking about emotions, talking about the well-being of our educators, where the system is getting it wrong, where we as individuals can pivot, make changes. Has this always been an issue or is this something newer that's come to the table? Thank you. And I I agree. I do feel very lucky to be in this career and to be 19 years in. And just to think back through the almost two decades, now the thousands of students I've had that I've been able to teach, that I've gotten to teach and that I've gotten to know and have just nurtured in my small way. (laughs) um, And then trying to continue launching them into their brave, exciting lives. For me, the awareness that I was lacking something in my teaching repertoire came on my very first day of teaching. But I wasn't able to identify the language and understand the vocabulary, understand myself through it until probably the last eight years. And then that's when I started on like a self-discovery, self-awareness journey. And since then, it's become so important to me that I share that with everyone else Mm -hmm. so that for our veteran teachers or perhaps our teachers who are in that year eight or year 12, where they're like, I truly thought this was going to get better because of the experience I'm now bringing to this profession. And yet I feel just as frustrated or fatigued as if I were in a year one situation or for our aspiring teachers to say, this is a profession that you want to be in. It's just a matter of preparing yourself holistically so you can Mm -hmm. enter it in a strong way. Uh, That has been 
a huge passion of mine for the last couple of years. Well, and so it's interesting. I'm thinking about, you know, you coming into your first day as a teacher and you've gone through all the curriculum, you've learned about everything that you were doing and how you're supposed to design your lesson plans and you walk in and there's always a bit of intimidation because you're meeting a bunch of new faces and obviously ratios for high school, you have a a much higher number of kids in your classroom than if you were teaching maybe kindergarten or preschool. So you got a lot of them coming in. They're all looking at you. They're all like, who is this person? (laughs) And there's a lot of sizing each other up. And that's normal. It happens anytime we go anywhere. Like I still have anxiety when I walk into a networking room because you're, it's the same thing. And that is a defense mechanism we have. So there was, that was going to happen no matter what. But you also had this subtle awareness of, I'm not equipped to handle X. And you didn't quite know what the language was, like you said, but there was an awareness of like, oh, something's missing. They didn't, there was maybe, maybe we needed another semester to have some sort of teaching (laughs) on something. What was that like for you? Because you kept going and maybe you had that same thought that other teachers did of it'll get better. I'll find my footing. Maybe you chalked it up to I'm new. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like it was deeper. It was a bigger hole, a bigger wound that was maybe there and getting created. Gosh, what was that like? Yeah, thank you. Uh, That's a powerful question. So yeah, to put it quite plainly, in my very first minutes, honestly, the opening minutes of my teaching career, I was met with noncompliance. And, you know, looking back on it, the issue that occurred, it's actually in the book that I've written, I outlined the entire story. And a lot of people have emailed me and contacted me about that story with sort of those like, oh my gosh, me too types mm-hmm. of messages. So it's in there. But uh, yeah, I, I was hit with a noncompliance and I'm young and I'm new and I'm trying to assert myself as the teacher who's in charge, the teacher who's in control. I want to make a good reputation for myself. And so, you're in your early 20s, right? Yeah. So you're also not that much older than the students that you're around. Okay. No, right. Exactly. So for me, I started my career teaching seniors and I was 22. Yeah. yeah I was like, just out of college. And, yeah. and I, I, I felt very um, confident. And of course, I was so excited. Yeah, so like my excitement in almost all things of my life has always sort of like gotten, you know, carried me through any yeah. sort of anxiety or tough times. And so I felt very ready. My lesson plans were ready. Everything's ready to go, except I was hit with this noncompliance. Mm-hmm. And because I had this um, expectation that I was the teacher in charge, I was the teacher in control, and therefore, naturally, the students should just listen to me. And there wouldn't be any real issues because they'd be coming to me expecting to listen to the teacher. I wasn't expecting it. So my response was to try to match the power which was a huge mistake. So instead of perhaps taking this pause and being like, okay, clearly this is outside of what I was expecting and let me just leave this here. And I'll circle back later with a much better plan where I'm in control. My emotions are regulated. I'm not escalating a situation. I did what I knew to do, which was to challenge back. Mm -hmm. And then I put the whole thing on display and it ended very badly. That was like the first 20 minutes of me teaching. (laughs) And I can tell you, like at the time, I didn't have the language and vocabulary to understand why I did what I did and to really fully understand what it felt like. I just knew it felt bad and I knew that it felt scary and I knew that I felt out of control. And then I felt ashamed because I was like, I was so ready to start this job. And now I feel like I can't even do the job. And what's going to happen tomorrow? And I was just, Mm. I mean, that fear spiral. I'm just, I'm just out of control and you have to keep showing up. There's no one who's going to do that job for you. You are the sole classroom teacher and no one's going to like pick up those pieces for you or, you know, take it from here. And then you can step in once it's all figured out. And um, yes, that's what happened in those first opening minutes. And it really wasn't for, because it was such a strong situation and I wasn't expecting it. It wasn't for many years later that I could now look back on that situation and be like, I know exactly why I did Mm -hmm. what I did. And I know exactly why it felt the way it felt. I didn't know it at the time, but now I do. And I'm so much better for having known it now. And then I can use that to my advantage when I'm perhaps experiencing something similar. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about sort of, so in 
your trainings to become a therapist, I'm assuming in other trainings as well, they talk a lot about a term transference and then countertransference. So this idea that when your relationship with your therapist becomes in your mind, you start to see maybe your mom through them. Or like for me, I would have it sometimes with clients because my mom struggled with drug addiction and she was in prison. And there were a lot of these pieces when I would see moms who were addicted to substances in my therapy office, especially during intern year, I made a very quick decision. I couldn't do that work without having that happen. I would react differently because you start to see them through your own personal lens. And I think what's so interesting about teaching, it's not the only profession, but it's definitely a profession I think that ranks pretty high in this is that we sort of sterilize the teaching experience and we remove the humanity of our teachers and the students through this like very sterile learning environment. And so, I mean, obviously we've known each other a collective 27 minutes maybe at this point. And I'm going to assume that some of your response was you grew up being taught that there were people in a position of authority. This is what it looks like. People are or deserve your respect. They're owed your respect. They don't have to earn it because they're the adult or they're the leader or they're whatever it is. And you were taught that and you were taught not to talk back and to be respectful and to do these things. So when you come in, that's your pattern of operating. Yeah. Not because you don't on one hand, maybe logically realize either this isn't about me, this is maybe fear or they're pushing me away. There's a lot of maybe distrust that they have about a new adult in their life or they are trying to feel things out or whatever, or maybe I don't like this feeling that they just have to respect me because I'm in the room, but because no conversation was had about, hey, what's your own emotional baggage that you're going to bring in? Yes. Let's talk about power dynamics and what you grew up learning about respect, about love, about conditioning in that regard. Because you didn't have that coming in, it's almost like you needed a therapist or someone sitting next to you to be like, let's process, let's just pause, let's freeze frame. And let's process what happened right here because you went to defense mode yes. and reacted because something happened and you felt like you had to protect yourself from what was coming at you. But nobody told you that. So you're just like, well, no, I'm just going to scream harder, which I've definitely done <laughs> more as a parent when I'm like, just listen to me. And then I realize, oh, that's my shit. <laughs> I who yes. I gotta go through that one and realize like yeah. why do I think you should just listen to me and why am I struggling right now? Yeah. But you've got twenty plus students and you've got a lesson plan and you've got city, state, federal things that you're supposed to meet. You don't got time for that. Like you just gotta get your shit together, come back in for day two and figure it out and hope that they listen. I love your point about the emotional baggage because that's been so much of the work that I'm trying to share mm-hmm. is that as teachers. We do have to understand ourselves on a deep introspective level in order to say, I have some of these, you know, you'll probably word it better for me, but you know, I'm calling them the shadows. You know, I have mm. some insecurities that exist in me. And yes. I may think that they're just in my personal life. I may think it's only the conflict I have. I'm just gonna put some examples out there with my family or this person yeah. down the road who lives in my neighborhood, or you know, this this, you know, colleague I have, this, you know supervisor I have. I may think that it's just in these professional or personal spaces, but in teaching, it comes from our whole world. So yeah. when I when I went to therapy, which is what started me on this whole self-introspective journey and understanding some of these patterns of stress that I was falling into, and but at the same time not wanting to leave teaching because I was like, I'm feeling disappointed by teaching. I'm feeling hurt by teaching, but I'm a really good teacher and I really Mm. like it. And I don't have that in my everyday all day. It's just these little pieces that come up. How can Mm -hmm. I make that better? So the therapist I saw, he gave me such a wise sentiment. I was trying to reason with him. You know, you don't understand. These are 15 year olds who are making me feel like this. And his point was like, people can get triggered by the three year old. People Mm -hmm. get triggered by an animal. It doesn't matter if you have an emotional response to something. We have to examine that, look at that, understand where is that coming from and why is it there? And now we have to find the strategies that work for you. Yeah. So for me, you know, when that student challenged me, it made me feel those things I already had in me. I yeah. just didn't know they were going to come out in my teaching career yeah. because I thought that I was in control and I thought that I was in charge. So the things that came out were like those heavy insecurities of like, well, you know, oh no, now he doesn't like me and Mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable when people don't like me. 
for now I'm not good enough. Like if I were good enough, I wouldn't have had this problem, but I must not be good enough. So I I now have this problem. Um, It really flared up a lot of my, a lot of those fears and insecurities that I live with. It's not that they show themselves in my everyday all day, but when approached and when triggered, they flare up. And then we have to execute a strategy. And I didn't understand that deep work at 22. I didn't understand that deep work when I was in the classroom for the first, you know, 10 years. I didn't understand it. I just would kind of be like, well, that, that, you know, that student's just tough. And now I have to figure out how to work through a tough student. And it's like, no, not necessarily. I know a lot of the reactions are coming from me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm outwardly giving them out to the group that I'm with. So everything that you're saying, um, no, oh, it's like if you were alongside me, how much stronger <laughs> I would have been in my opening. You would have been like, let's just talk about why. Uh, well, you'll read it in the book if you're interested yeah. in the listeners, but it had to do of all things coffee and a trash can. And let's talk about why you picked that trash can up, you know? Yeah. Um, but I was, I was in a seminar uh, a couple of months ago. I had the beautiful opportunity to talk to year four undergraduate students who want to be in teaching. Mm. And that's one of my goals is to talk to these younger um, aspiring teachers. So I had a nice group there and one student raised her hand and she was at the time in her student teaching. And she shared with the group about how she found herself yelling at a third grader. And she was like, everything that you're saying, I was like shocked that I started yelling at this kid. I've never yelled. She's like, I've never yelled before. And I was like, I hear you guilty. Mm-hmm. Like I've done some things too that I'm like, I never did that before. Where'd that come from? Mm-hmm. And, uh, or she was like, next thing you know, I'm yelling back at him. And I was like, even as I was yelling at him, I'm in my head going, why are you yelling yeah, at this What child? are you doing? Yeah. And I was so happy to have had that wisdom from the therapist I saw, because I was able to say to her, it doesn't matter that he's eight. He could yeah. have been three. He could have been yeah. 38. It doesn't matter. You had an emotional response to the intensity that he was bringing to your space. Mm -hmm. And you didn't understand yourself well enough to say, this is why I'm having this escalated response. How can I bring myself back to center so I can behave in a way that I'm teaching through this student's behavior or I'm teaching through this situation and it's not getting the best of me. And then I go home empowered with a plan and don't go home all shaken up, not waiting to come back tomorrow. Yeah. So that was a great experience I had a few months ago where I could actually one-on-one in a group setting give this yeah. like lesson, this this hard won wisdom, so to speak. And right. I think I made a nice difference. I was very happy with how it went. Well, I feel like it's this, you know, essentially what we are dancing around, which obviously makes sense because the podcast is entirely about shame, but we're talking about shame. And I feel this, I did a closing keynote for graduating teachers this past year And that was the entirety of our conversation was shame resilience. And one of the big conversation points we had is that oftentimes when you find yourself interested in some sort of helping profession, a profession where you are coming in, guiding, teaching, supporting, taking care of people, there is a high likelihood that you have the skills in it and you've also been conditioned to believe you need to do it. Maybe you were always the one that took care of everybody. Maybe if we look at family dynamics, you were sort of parentified. You took care of whether it was siblings, maybe your parents or your caregivers. You were the friend that everybody went to that they could count on. If you were in the group project, everybody knew that you would take care of it. So there was always somebody that just didn't do their share, assuming, you know, Diane's going to do it. It's going to be done. Mm -hmm. And what happens is as you are sort of simultaneously developing your identity and who do I have to be to secure a place in this world and you start to be put in this role, the belief starts to become, I need to be able to take care of anything that comes my way. I need to be able to take care of everyone. I need to be the person that people can rely on, that can handle hard things, whatever it is. That's my role. Because if I can't do that, then who am I? What do I have? And then that's the shame piece. This is now the performance. If you can keep this up, gosh, you're going to have a place because everybody always needs someone that they know is going to finish the group project. So if you can be that person there's your guarantee. And so often what ends up happening is when we don't dissect it, we don't go back and realize you've been spending decades, you know, even you at 22, you would have had 22 years, even if we say 21 to give you your first baby year of like, you're still being conditioned, but maybe you weren't as aware. Right. 
20 to 22 years of conditioning to say, this is who I have to be. And this is what it looks like to be accepted for being X. Mm -hmm. I still go back to my master's program and being like, why can't I not get an A? I am so hell bent that I have to get an A. And my supervisor, she was one of my professors. She was like, well, what if you just didn't turn in my last assignment? What if you just let yourself get a B in my class? If you just didn't do the last assignment, you just didn't hand it in, you just get a B. And then you could realize it doesn't matter. And I was like, this sounds like a great opportunity in the back of my head going, and I'm not going to fucking do that because I need to have A's. So I didn't do it because in my head, I had to have it. I can tell you logically that somebody not liking me, me not being the first place, me not having straight A's, me not being able to walk into a room and be the best therapist with somebody, it doesn't really define me, but your shame says it does. And so for you, the moment that challenge happened for that person with the eight-year-old, the moment that that happened, it was that whatever they did or said, it was almost like they peeled back the curtain in the Wizard of Oz and now you're exposed and the vulnerability is there and you have to defend. And typically we defend to assert more power, either we do this sort of, I'm just going to be the submissive, take care of everything. I'm going to default to that. But usually in teaching, when there's already an inherent power dynamic, it's I'm going to go harder. Yeah. And I'm going to get that spot because I have to defend against this vulnerability because it would be too risky. And then I will be found out. And then who am I if I can't do this right? And that's the part that I think people don't realize is this is not a deficiency in you as a person, this is a systemic problem in the fact that we aren't talking about this. And for you and me, we're in our 30s and 40s just starting to talk about this. Yeah. For those people that are coming in, these young kids, most of them have parents who are maybe just starting to figure it out or they're still running the game of deflecting. They don't know what the fuck they're doing either. So they're doing the best they can. We're just all sitting there and we're expected to take care of it in the room or you specifically as teachers, instead of being able to say, oh my gosh, we're just all humans and we don't know what we're doing, but it doesn't feel safe to do that because you're still expected to achieve. And the tolerance for a teacher not having it together, especially now, seems very low. Just listening to you talk, it's like I can feel myself growing and and Mm. understanding myself even more, you being able to just provide your insight and the language that you're using to to make me realize like absolutely what I experienced. And it wasn't even just that very first day. Yeah. Uh, I have a whole book written because right. it, it was like what was occurring over and over again. And you're right. It is that feeling of shame where you're like, I was expecting myself to be better at this. I was expecting mm-hmm. this for myself to show up better. Yep. I was expecting this to go the way I had it in my head, which also ties into expectations. Yes. And, you know, and yourself and, yeah. and your worth and they all really do run together, but you have these expectations and then when they're not met and then you can recognize like, well, geez, I think some of that was on me. There was some blame there or at least it felt like it was for me. Yeah. That's where you experience that shame. And I think, uh, you know, in writing my book, I talked to about 80 teachers Now, some of those stories are in the book and some of them were just echoes of other things that I had felt and, you know, people that I had, I was able to share some of the stories in the book had said, but it always came back to the same thing. It was always this idea of, um, I have been hurt by teaching and therefore, Mm. and it was like three paths. It was like, therefore I'm going to retire the moment I can. So I'm not going to leave it but I can't tell you I love it the way I thought I was going to, or that I show up every day loving it. Mm. And these could be 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 55 year olds. It didn't matter. It was like, when can you retire? And I I would make a joke like 2048, like I would just joke, you know, kind of lighten (laughs) it up. Uh, But in some cases it was like, no, yes, that's the answer. Uh, That was one path. The other path, the teachers who would, you know, I've been hurt by teaching and therefore I'm angry at Mm. teaching and I show up angry and I'm kind of like, the unapproachable me, but I wasn't always this way. And I certainly didn't expect to be this way. And I'm the one who tells people, do not go into teaching. I'm the one who tells my own children, I will not pay for your college education if you choose to go into education as a major. Um, And then the third path were the teachers who were like, uh, I'm going to do anything but this. 
So I'm going to raise my children for a while and figure things out, or I'm going to support my spouse in the corporate world, or I'm going to take my skill set, which we have incredible executive functioning as teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take my skill set and I'm going to go do something else. And then you realize like, what year are you in? And they're like, you're seven, they're year eight, you know, they're year six. Uh, Like those early years, eight and under are such a vulnerable time. And then the other vulnerable time is your year 23 to 28, which people don't see it that way. But those are the teachers who have invested so much, they're tired and they're kind of frustrated. Um, And then they're like, well, I can take some of my benefits, some of my pension or whatever, Mm. and I can go to a second job, but I have enough in there that I can still sort of like, you know, cushion my next career option. That's the second most vulnerable subgroup I learned. So yeah, that, that's what it is. And, and I, I appreciate your work and how much you understand this because when it comes down to it, we're all experiencing the same thing. And while yeah. we're getting a little bit stronger and bolder at talking about it, I want to argue that we're, we're stopping at a most crucial point. So we're sharing the hurts, the pains, the chaos, the yeah. disappointment of teaching, but we're not sharing what we're doing about it. So mm-hmm. if you go on to social media, you could find, or you go into the news and you read articles about teacher burnout, teacher frustration. You can read, watch, hear lots of people who are sharing their stories. I want to argue that I don't know if a lot of people are then extending it to say, yeah, this was harder than what I thought in these specific ways that I wasn't expecting. And this is what I've learned from it. And this is what I do now. And I want to give that to you, which is what I'm trying Mm. to do. And I see that you're doing the same thing. But I see, you know, when I'm on social media, I'm reading the news. I'm like, everyone's just stopping at this pain point. And no one's really extending it to, but here are some things you can do about it. That kind of go beyond like a basic self-care. Right. You know, it goes deeper. Like your work is much deeper. Um, What is making you feel this way? what self or what perception did you have of yourself or the profession that's now being challenged, that's now triggering a hurt, triggering a pain? And what can we do about that? Well, I think a couple of things are coming up in the sense of, you know, for someone that is, I think, feeling some of these things, there's, there's a a few points that feel very lonely. So Mm -hmm. one, obviously you come in and you're sort of solely responsible for your classroom, maybe depending on the school district you're in or the grade that you're teaching, you might have a teaching assistant or someone else that's in the space with you, but there's an incredible amount of responsibility on you. And it's like you leave school, your schooling, and then you're just sort of left to figure it out, which is a lot of jobs. That's a really lonely feeling. And it does put somebody that already has these very high expectations and norms about how they have to show up in a place where that can be, that can be a lot. Mm -hmm. So then when they come in, it just starts to be an accumulation of tick marks that say, you're not doing enough. Mm -hmm. You don't have this figured out. And because we aren't talking about the pain and what we do about it as a collective culture, it sort of feels a little like a pass the buck situation with teachers. Mm -hmm. And I've had this conversation even at my daughter's preschool of like, I've now stepped in as this parent liaison to try to support the three classrooms that they're running because the teachers are burnt out. Mm -hmm. Now, it is very fair that I still have certain expectations, like when they were showing them 30 minutes of screen time every day and I found out, hey, that's not cool. That's like literally against all of our values and there's Mm -hmm. a reason we send them there. Mm -hmm. If you're burnt out and overwhelmed, then you need to ask for support during that time, even if it's having a parent aid during that time that you need some volunteers in the classroom that's not okay. Right. But also recognizing how do we support you as people? You are going through a lot. You are seeing our ki- our COVID kids that are learning these social emotional skills that have very different skill sets and they're learning and they can thrive and it looks different. You know, my daughter's primary teacher has been doing this for like almost 30 years. Wow. That's amazing. It looks very different now than it does then. And I think we've sort of in tandem to that thought, I'm having the thought of how education, it's felt very similar to, I was watching a reel that talked about motherhood and the idea of, you know, moms back in the fifties were like, you know, my kids are fed and they got a place to sleep. Like I'm good. I'm, I get an A plus and we're like, but did I make all their snacks from scratch? I can't buy the Z bar because Instagram told me I can make it myself and I can save money in the budget. And did I rotate their books and do they have toys that do STEM and art and that like, there's so 
the stakes are higher. And I think we've also increased the stakes and expectations for teachers because we as people are so overwhelmed. And then we're like, well, fuck it. I can't figure this out. So it's the teacher's problem. So then there's another loneliness for the teachers of I am here because I want to be. I don't just love English. I want to help other people love English. I'm not just here because I think like world history is fun. I'm here because I want to help other people get excited about learning and find themselves and their identity and their potential, you know, whatever their focus is. So then there's another point of loneliness. The third one I'm thinking about is then the expectations of performance, where then you get this, well, your classroom's not doing as well as this, or what about this? And here's the grades that they're getting. And instead of going, how can we support you? Or how can we better support these students? It's, well, what are you going to do about it? Which is another loneliness factor. So I feel like for a lot of people that get to those kind of three paths, the anger, the hurt, there's also a big loss of trust Mm -hmm. that people are going to listen and that anything is going to be done. And I think we have to move through and grieve that and figure out some next steps because I think you're right. Any of us can complain it's very easy. It's very, I'm very good at it. I've definitely fall into those paths sometimes where I just like, the world is against me. The world is the problem. I have no control. Everything is terrible. And I want somebody to tell me that my life is harder than everybody else's. I definitely have that at least once every six to eight weeks, but also then going, okay, but what onus and control do I have? And not saying you're just responsible, but what power do you have and how do you want to use it? Because if you choose to come in angry every day, that's a choice you're making. Right. You don't have to make that choice. It isn't fair that X, Y, and Z are happening. How do you want to help? What capacity do you have? But also, if you choose to let that be the reason that you show up and be angry every day, you are giving all of your power and control to a system yes. instead of taking onus and control about how you're going to change your life and in turn be a, a cog that's helping change the system as well. So I'm thinking about all of that. I'm thinking about how you really want to be talking to these new teachers, but also you're trying to talk to current teachers that are in that place and position. How do we, I guess, first, let's think about teacher to teacher. How do we break the loneliness gap there? And then I'm curious, what conversations need to be happening with parents, with caregivers, with administrators, with the everyday person? How do we reshape the system? Yeah, those are very powerful questions and really big questions. But I want to say that the teacher to teacher, I think, does exist. So if you were to be in a school system mm-hmm. and you're feeling that frustration, disappointment, hurt, and loneliness, you probably have your go to colleague. You know, like we all have colleagues that we can, like, you know, we're, we're, we're collegial and we're professional, but right. I wait to really share my stuff, you know? Yes. Um, but a lot of times these conversations are happening in teacher lunchrooms. They're happening in the classroom, down the hall, with the door somewhat closed at the 3 o'clock p.m., 2.30 p.m. time frame. Yeah. You know, they're happening on text at 9 o'clock at night. You know, um, They're happening on social media. There's tons of teachers who are sharing out their classroom pains and experiences, and they have thousands of followers because people are like, yeah, I feel this too, or I want to hear it. So I want to say that teacher to teacher is happening, but I don't know if it like, aside from being able to share the experience and get the validation, I don't know if you really leave feeling much better. I think you kind of leave the school day feeling like, I'm glad someone heard me. I'm glad someone's in this with me, but damn, it is still on me. And like, Mm -hmm. how do I do? Um, I think what what means, maybe I, I don't know how to word it. You probably will help me word it better, but like one thing that could help to move it in a place that's positive is that when we have these experiences, being able to trust the person we're going to share them with, who could actually have some momentum to change it, yeah. will also agree that it's problematic and then get mm-hmm. involved. So I never want to be this generalized, like, oh, this subgroup is to blame or that subgroup doesn't support. I think it's so variable. But the idea of like, if you are hearing that, okay, this teacher is struggling in this classroom, then perhaps we need to separate some of those students. And that's like an administration protocol. That's yeah. not the teacher can't do that. The teacher can't take a child off his or her roster. The teacher has to educate whomever comes through the threshold of the door. So that has to be like the Alice the principal or the director of the school who gets involved and says, I see you and I see that you're struggling. And these are just things that we can do to help support you. 
And like you already shared, maybe it is getting some volunteers in the classroom. Maybe it's finding some open space to say, uh, we're going to divide and conquer this a little bit. What's your lesson for today? What are the skills that the students have to learn? We're taking this small group over here, and then you're going to have a smaller group in the classroom with you. And we're going to talk students through whatever's going on. And then we're going to see if we can make this work so that you keep mm-hmm. showing up as your best self and you can give. Or if it is a conversation with a parent, and sometimes I have conversations and I'm like, thank you for understanding and thank you for talking to your student. And the next day, it's, it's incredibly better. And I know that conversation happened mm-hmm. and I'm like, thanks for the support. And other times, it's, it's the parent feels so overwhelmed. You know, I teach high school. And in a lot of cases, the parents like, yeah, I've, I've gotten a phone call every year since this grade, or I don't know what to do. They don't listen to me either. And the parent feels so frustrated and so flustered. So is that maybe that a guidance counselor gets involved or yeah. is the parent at least able to say, um, okay, you're telling me that the phone is an issue. I'm going to keep that phone home and I'm going to make mm-hmm. sure it happens. The parent has to get a little tough lovey, which can be very uncomfortable. And there's lots of dynamics that play into parenting and the needs parent have to make their child happy or what they think is going to make their child happy. It's complicated business. And yeah. that's why I keep going back to this saying of teaching is emotional. So for me, it's like, you know, could we change some of these systems? Could we reduce and lower the volume on some of these pains? But if we can't, what can we do with it ourselves? Yeah. To say, I acknowledge that when I'm in this space, it makes me feel this way. And that's okay. Because now I have all these strategies that I can use to stay empowered. Mm-hmm. And that's what I think we have to work, especially if, you know, once we get to the point where we recognize like not much is going to change here, um, we have to be willing to then ooh, kind of regulate ourselves on our own. Well, and I do think it comes back to for anybody that's gotten into the profession. I mean, you talk about this. It's so important to you to come back regularly to what is your why in Mm -hmm. teaching in your life as a whole. And what you're essentially saying to people is you're inviting them to also get clear on what are your values, what feels fulfilling to you, how do you want to lead your life? And I think it does suck when you feel like, okay, well, what if I do do that and I still don't get the support? What if I go, like sometimes there's a safety in just staying in complaint without complaining to people that can do something about it Mm -hmm. because at least you're sort of in this ambiguous place. If you really do tell all the people and you don't get the help you need, it's even more defeating. And then you're like, well, now what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. I've exhausted everything and I don't have the ability to change careers or I can't retire yet or whatever the case may be. I think there's a couple elements within that though around we've created such a hustle culture. Like think about so many of the friends that I have now that are opting to homeschool their kids Mm. because they're like, the pace is too fast. Or my kid is really struggling in the classroom when they have to do X, Y, and Z all the time. And, and it's not, we don't like the teachers. It's not, it's the school. That's the problem. I think there are definitely people that make those choices for those reasons. But in a lot of the conversations I'm having, it's, we want to figure out how to help our student, our kid, learn it a way where they can feel empowered and successful. And the really hard part is in these bigger school settings, the systems aren't designed to do that. And I think the really hard part is when you see it and when you're in there with the kids every day, like I used to work at the state level for a mental health nonprofit. Mm -hmm. We would get these national regulations or asks that would come down. And I'm like, "Mm, hard pass for (laughs) us in this state, because I work with all of these people that are on the ground supporting their communities. This won't work for us. Mm -hmm. And there's not really a way to do that. And when teachers are also in a scarcity from political climates of like, what funding do we have? How many more students are we going to have in our classroom? How much more are we going to be expected to take on? It doesn't feel like you have the right to slow things down. Mm -hmm. And to say, you know what, today we're not going to focus on this. Or for this week, we're actually just going to talk about trust. Oh, How do we trust each other? How do we even do that? Because we have to share this hour together every week. Where do you react? Like, what is reactivity? Let's talk about emotions where you're learning alongside them. There isn't the luxury in the lesson plan to do that. And Mm -hmm. so it is a lot, I think, for the individuals. I think what you're saying that's really important, though, is Sometimes when we're burnt out and we hear this task, and that's where I think this, the teacher self-care thing comes in sometimes is like, well, just take better care of yourself. Here's these like plans. And you're like, I am so burnt out that by the time I get home, it takes everything out of me just to wash my face and to put pajamas on. 
Like I don't have it. And so it's trying to recognize, can we think about taking control of the parts of our life that we get to and that we're excited about? And so I'm sure you would agree. Therapy is not easy. You're not like, whew, this is good. I love feeling all these feelings, but recognizing that there is a point where it is going to feel really hard. People are going to feel really burnt out and overwhelmed, but then you can get to a place where you feel a little bit lighter, a little bit more empowered. Cause then in those day-to-day interactions where you get triggered, your emotions are going to happen. Like you said, teaching is emotional. That's your whole standpoint. Mm -hmm. You cannot stop the emotions from coming in the room, but you can learn that instead of when you reacted at 10 and you were screaming back at an (laughs) eight-year-old, you can condition your brain to see that as a two or a three. It's the same thing I'm learning as parenting. Yes. Stuff that used to trigger me because of my own things from childhood where I'm like, why the fuck am I at a seven? This (laughs) is a two. I don't understand. And I'm watching myself get to a seven and I cannot stop it. I don't know how, but now that I've done the work, yes. every once in a while, I still hit the seven because I'm human and I've got new sticky spots. It's like glitter. It's still in there. But for the most part, I can be at a two. I'm way less burnt out now because I'm not spending that energy. And I think that's ultimately what you're saying to teachers is this can be a sustainable profession. Yes. Part of you creating a sustainable profession is to learn the skills to validate, to process, to heal your wounds and learn how to regulate your emotions so you aren't expending so much time and energy there because we can't control a lot of these other things. We can be a part of it. We can raise our voice, but we don't have control. And if you focus over there, you're going to get lost in those three routes like you've seen with everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you bringing up the parenting too, because the the work that I did, and I, I mean, it's, it's ongoing. Once right. you start this work, you're, you're, gosh, it's like you're reborn into a new self while you continue to examine how far you've come by seeing your old self. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's things that happened in my classroom or my personal life today. I'm like, geez, five years ago, yeah. <laughs> I would have reacted this way. Like, look at how yes. far I've come. Or just my ability now to lower my voice and mm-hmm. to very calmly state expectations for in this space. I, you know, I work on that I project learning, that I take care of the learning in here. And in this space, we're going to choose these mature professional ways to conduct ourselves. You know, I don't get all wrought up, you know, it's like, even mm-hmm. that is a skill that you learn, you practice. I mean, I feel a lot of, like I have it in my book. I would practice in the mirror um, yep. to be able to hear myself, be an authority voice, be an assertive voice, especially when I knew I was coming into something that wasn't going to easily just accept that. Yeah, and yeah. I, uh, so much of this has helped me with my parenting too, because even for myself, I have two children and you know, you go into it and you think, Oh, I'm going to be this kind of parent. Yep. And then next thing you know, you're overwhelmed, you're tired, you overnight, a given, let's just say you had a situation where you know you went a full term pregnancy, had a child and came home from a hospital setting, like, you know, three days later, two days later, it's like almost overnight, your life is no longer really your life. And you're dealing mm-hmm. with all of that. And you know, again, you can feel this constant catch up, Like I'm just not, I'm, I'm working so hard. And I feel like I'm at a 40% level of how this feels like it should be. And that can really, you know, erode you over time. And for my own self, it's like, why am I so upset? Because my child doesn't like this thing. Yeah. Or why am I so upset? Because they're not achieving in this way. Yeah. Or why am I so upset? Because they're demanding of me. And mm-hmm. I would fall into that trap. And I love what you said to me earlier, because I learned so much about myself, like, you know, half an hour ago that I have myself positioned to be the doer, to be the one that people look to, to have things completed. And I do it at a high level and I feel good about my accomplishments. So when you have a two-year-old, three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old who you could play with for eight hours out of a day, you could give eight hours of your day to that child and the child could still go to bed and say, you never did blank with me today. And you're like, really? Are you kidding me? But they have no sense of what the day meant for Uh you or, you know, all you hear is I'm not good enough. All you hear is here I am not measuring up. Here's this child pointing out to me how I didn't do this thing for him or her. That's what you hear. That's not the reality of what it is. And it's like, how can we bring ourselves back to a reality and say, okay, yeah, that maybe just pushed my buttons a little bit, but let's remind ourselves of what we did today, what was so good. And then guess what? It looks like we have something fun to do tomorrow. 
We'll make yeah. that our number one tomorrow. And then you get this empowerment where you're teaching through the behaviors or the, you know, the comments, but you're also keeping yourself regulated. And that's something I've had to continually work on, but it sure has made my parenting better. It's made me a better teacher because I can see students for what they, well, at least perceptively, what they may need, seem to need, meet them where they are, not expect them to be something more than what they are, you know, Mm -hmm. and to keep that open space, you know, and and to keep inviting, like this has an ability to change. Um, But right now I see that if I show up this way, it seems to set us up for the most success and and work versus fighting it and and resisting it, which only leaves me feeling frustrated at the end of the day. I love this. I feel like me too. (laughs) For so many people that are listening to this, they're like, yeah, I get that. And I think sort of the takeaways I'm thinking about as we wrap up, at least for me, is sometimes I don't leave enough. Having expectations is not a problem. When your expectations are inflexible and not Mm -hmm. context driven, that's I think when the problems get created. And so Mm -hmm. I'm thinking a lot about how I can invite a little bit more flexibility sometimes in my expectations of myself, of other people, because when we create that flexibility, there's less of that, well, here's where it was supposed to be. It didn't meet there. And now I'm disappointed or they're disappointed. And instead we go, gosh, things look different. Like my daughter did the same thing yesterday. Well, we didn't go biking. I was like, (laughs) well, right. We didn't go biking, but also we had this amazing day that was all about celebrating your bravery for getting your flu shot. And we went and got ice cream and we saw Halloween decorations and we went and did an art project and we did this and that. And it's like, instead of recounting that, because I need her to validate that I'm a good mom, I said, you're right, we didn't go biking. And that sounds like you wish we had had more time before bedtime to go biking. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And that's that recognizing of just shifting the expectation. She just had it in her head. We were going to be able to go biking. She's four and a half. She doesn't know what time is. She still marks things by how many sleeps until something happens. Like she's like, how many more sleeps until I see this person? Seven? Nope. It'll be next year. So 30? (laughs) Nope. Like 300. How many is that? Uh, Like those things, like just coming back to how do we do that? So I'm thinking about that. The other thing I think about for people is it sounds like such an invitation, whether you're in the teaching profession or not, to really think about what are we saying when we're using our voice? And so Mm -hmm. are we spending all of our time complaining, which is an act of disempowerment, Mm -hmm. or are we creating an opportunity to validate our feelings and then also reclaim a sense of empowerment? Yeah. The last thing I'm hearing, which I really want to reiterate, and then I want you to be able to tell everybody where they can find you and also where they can get your book. I know it'll be in the show notes, but I want them to hear it from you. Thank you. But the last thing I'm hearing is really for anyone in the teaching profession and specifically people thinking about teaching, when the dynamic is such that now the momentum is, well, you shouldn't do this. Teaching is bad. Teaching is just going to burn you out. It's overwhelming. There's a lot of reactivity that's led to that also. Teaching is not bad. You don't have to experience a negative experience. Teaching is hard and you are charging yourself and you are being charged with a tremendous responsibility that oftentimes is going to feel thankless. That is many of the different jobs out there and you can be supported. You can be empowered. You can have a very successful, meaning fulfilling career for you. And you maybe want to buy this book and put it in your curriculum to make sure that you've done all the work to think about your emotions because it's not just lesson planning. Yeah. So, okay, as we come to a close, I want you to tell everybody, where can they find you? Where can they get your book? Any last pieces we want to say before we wrap up and they all race to go get it and add it to their shelves? Thank you so much. So you can go to Amazon and you could type in, I didn't sign up for this teacher book. And or I didn't sign up for this, and then you'll you'll find my name, Diane Manser. You'll find that beautiful front cover, which is a teacher looking like she's in distress. And there's a little swirl of an arrow that leads to a power pose because it's a journey. So I came across the title because someone who was helping me with the title of the book said, well, "What's the thing that people say when they're feeling frustrated and they're feeling like they can't come back in September and it's June?" And I said, oh, I always hear people say, I didn't sign up for this. And then the person mm-hmm. said, well, there's your title. And my reaction was, yeah, but I'm not sitting in that. Um, I'm trying to say that I learned 
through, I learned about myself. I learned how to, how to handle it and how to try to work through it. Even if I have a day that disrupts me and I feel disempowered, I now can work some strategies. And I have a plan. I don't just sit in that for too long. So that's why the subtitle comes in there about one classroom's journey, one classroom teacher's journey through uh, emotional fatigue and personal empowerment. So you can find that on Amazon. I also have a website. It's called uh, teachingisemotional.com. I'm on TikTok, Instagram. I have a private Facebook group that's Teaching is Emotional. But that website is a great resource because I have a book study tab and you and a friend, um, a small group at school, you could read the book. And then there's a chapter outline of discussion questions, reflection questions, resources, news articles that tailor to every single chapter. So as you read, um, not only would you have your own organic validations and your own thoughts and reflection, but that could also be a resource that you use. Or if any younger uh, people who are aspiring to be teachers um, want to do a little book club, that teachingisemotional.com website book study tab would be something that you could go to as a resource as you read. So thank you for letting me share that. I'm hoping people will check it out. I've gotten such amazing feedback. Uh, I've gotten emails. People have written me letters. Um, you know, people have shared with me like this is this is the reason why I got into teaching. This is why it was hard for me. And you brought me back at a time when I really needed it. And thank you. And I just am like, oh my god, because I was. It's such a personal story. I was mm-hmm. a bit scared in publishing it, but I just kept on telling myself, no, there are people out there. I talked to eighty of them. Yeah, and there are people out there who need to hear this. We need to bring it back to beyond the this is hard. We need to say yeah. teaching is emotional, and that's what we're walking into. So then, what do we do about it now? And mm. that's where I wanted to get. Um, so thank you, Kira, for understanding all that I said, bringing it back to me in such a centered way that made me feel good, validated, learning about myself too, but then also outreaching to your listeners to bring them into the conversation. You're just a master. Thank you oh, so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, master. And- I am. I'm so excited. I'll put the links for people to directly get to your Amazon page, to be able to get the book, to go to your website. Of course, you have a book study tab on your website to be able to help people. As soon as you said it, I was like, well, yeah, I guess now I'd be surprised if you didn't. So I'm sure it's (laughs) wonderful for people. And I think that's so helpful because it's really breaks it down and gives people a sense to recognize now we're not just reading this book alone and trying to internalize it, but read it with someone else. And I think about a lot of, I I have a lot of family members and friends that are in the preschool settings and the early childhood childcare settings. And I feel like even that to be having some of these conversations around when you feel like you're reacting to that four-year-old that's saying no or doing these things, here's what might be going on. And how do we shift some of those perspectives for us and realizing, (laughs) yeah, maybe you didn't sign up for this experience and we are in a world that is very different than most of us thought it was going to be. Yeah. Our decision is whether or not we adapt and shift to preserve ourselves and the nature of our work and the impact that we have. And so I just love that. I think it's amazing. I'm so grateful to you for coming on. And so listeners, remember, come back and take the a little piece with you each time, whether it is, okay, today I'm really going to be thinking about expectations. This time I'm going to be thinking about my role as a parent and maybe what I can do to support another teacher or someone in that profession. Or if you are a parent and maybe you've discouraged your young one from thinking about things, how could you reframe some of your own kind of negative experiences and thoughts as well? And so just taking bits and pieces, I also really want to encourage whether you're a teacher or not, just to check out the book, just to really start to build some of that empathy around all of this experience that Diana shared. Diane, I'm so excited for all of this for you and the impact I know that you're going to have. And Listeners, for now, take this with you. Go kind of walk through the day and we will see you back here next Sunday. 